catch up because I know it's a little bit of a lag. Um, and then hopefully we are broadcasting now. So good oh, good morning, good afternoon. I never know what, what lunchtime, what time it is. Um, I am Sam Blake and uh, welcome to the writing.ie Facebook page um, and hopefully YouTube too, if everything is working. We have a very exciting guest for you today. Um, Stephen Hall is the 2000, wrote the 2007 novel, The Raw Shark Text, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of, um, which won the Somerset Morn Award and was shortlisted for the Arthur C. Clarke Award as well. Um, it was an international bestseller. It's been translated into over 30 languages. Um, and in 2013, uh, Stephen was named one of Grant's best, best young British novelists, uh, which is pretty impressive and hard to say. Um, he's written widely for video and gaming world, which is really interesting. And he's also been developing uh, various projects for TV and film. Um, but we're here today because after 10 years, um, he has produced a book called Maxwell's Demon, um, which has been massively critically claimed um and he hasn't but he hasn't been sitting on his laurels for the last 10 years so we're going to be finding out what what went on and what he's been up to um i'm going to bring in mr truen now who is going to chat Stephen. just come in there we go hi simon how are you how is london oh we've no sound hang on a minute your sound's not on uh, i'm great <laughs> uh it's a beautiful friday day uh friday in london and i'm really looking forward to this interview Excellent. Questions. Excellent. Nothing else can go wrong at this stage. So let's just bring Stephen in. There we go. Everybody will give us our yeah, technical hitches. But oh. anyway, good morning, Stephen. Lovely to see you. I'm going to vanish and I shall leave the two of you together. And hopefully there will be no technical hitches. <laughs> yeah. she? Well, there we go. Finally, we are together. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. How are you doing? I'm very well indeed. Yeah. Um, so I'm 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 really tempted to say you know what have you been doing for the last fifteen years? <laughs> but we're not we're not going to say that. I'm, I, just, I just want to take I want to take you back to um, way before Raw Shark Text, which was of course um, not even called Raw Shark Text when you first thought about it. Now just remind me. I think I think you were working in social security office, where you were doing, or a library, or remind me what you were doing when you were writing your first book. I was making telephone directories. You were making telephone directories. Yeah. So I was I typing that. in ads and lists of names and phone numbers in telephone directories. So the first book I technically ever published was the whole local telephone directory. Brilliant. Mm. I, I must I must make sure you get PLR for that and you add the ISBN <laughs> to your uh, CV. Um, so that was a kind of data entry job. But when yeah. you weren't doing that, you were at home writing because you had to write. It was what you needed to do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I started off as an artist. It, it sort of happened a little bit by surprise. I went to art school and was doing a fine art degree in it. I became very interested in working with text and the visual aspects of text as, as an image. And it sort of evolved from there, really. The text got more complicated and developed stories and backstories and became series. And then there was text in between the visual texts. And then, yeah, it kind of started to turn into stories and books and, and took me by surprise a little bit. And I think also I got to that point where I'd studied art for a long time and I felt a little trapped by it. I felt like I knew so much art theory that I couldn't really maneuver. Mm. And although I always loved reading and had written a little bit when I was younger, I'd, I kind of, it felt like a bit more of a blank canvas for me that I could go and kind of jump sideways into. And I felt like I had more creative space. So I just sort of went with it. Yeah. And started my degree as an artist and finished it as a writer. But you, but in everything you've, written ever since the have including the visual into the text haven't you yeah that's important to me and it'll probably always be important to me i like um because something i've always liked to do is work in a lot of different mediums i kind of i like to look at what a medium can do that none others can, none of the others can and what's really interesting to me about books is the pages the physicality the fact yeah. that you're you know, you're moving through uh, pages full of symbols, essentially, and you're 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 involved mm -hmm. in this act of creation where you're imagining, you're visualizing, and decoding. And it's always been interesting to me to kind of play around with what you're decoding versus what you're seeing. So it's nice to have 
visual imagery as well as mental imagery and kind of that challenge between the two things is interesting to me and and to have a surface as well that doesn't move you know if you're making a film yeah you're 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 running with the time of the film or the tv show or whatever it is but with the book you can stay on a page for an hour if you want to and that lends itself to that kind of labyrinthine building complicated things that as a reader you can turn the book around and dig into there's not many mediums you can actually you as the as the audience the viewer the reader whatever can actually control mm. in that way so it's kind of nice to be able to build complicated things on the page that people can take their time with if that makes sense it absolutely does and i'm i'm just leaping forward and i'm going to come back but obviously your the debut novel was published in many 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 languages that i imagine you don't read that's true so in a way you're holding a copy of your book which has embedded into it your wish for the reader to decode what's going on through use of symbols but you yourself are looking at a version of it that is codified into a language you don't read mm -hmm. but you kind of know what's going on on the page don't you because you know where you are in the narrative it I imagine you're one of the few writers that probably gets a real kick out of that. Yeah. In a way, taking the book to an even another level, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's amazing. And actually sort of reverse engineering your knowledge of that language by what you already know that line says and seeing how it's yeah. been changed and how the wording works and the visual elements as well, how they have to change. And what was interesting with Rorschach, because we did it in so many languages, the, the very best translators brought their own ideas and they said, you know, this word also has this connotation. So if we push it in this way or change the visual image to do this, then we're also kind of saying this thing, which is two completely separate ideas in English, but stuff you can, you get these opportunities in other languages, which is cool. And then of course, there's the Japanese edition where you start at the back of the book and work to the front. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so so if we, if we if we go back to Raw Shark, I mean, we have we have our central character Eric Sanderson who wakes up with no, basically no not with no memory, does he? Yeah, yeah. Was that the starting point for the book, or was the ideas was it the ideas that you wanted to explore and reverse engineered into Eric? A little bit of both. There were two stories I wanted to tell. One was very much. Eric's story it was about two people who are very close together and one of them is lost and then just that, that sort of exploration of what you know because so much of who we think we are is what's reflected back at us right and so taking away someone's mirror you know someone's mirror that they're super dependent on and seeing who that person becomes mm. was interesting to me I think I was also interested in this sort of thought game about language that um you know, I, I was collecting them, This these water words that show up over and over again when you talk about thinking or memory or, you know, that we always use these water words. It's like stream of consciousness, yep. depth of the unconscious, flow of conversation. You know, they're just always there and it's surprising that they, they crop up again and again. And I, I was kind of idly collecting them. And then the game was to sort of create an ecosystem that would exist in that site that sort of waterway or that sort of flow. And the two things weren't quite big enough or developed enough to be a thing, which is why I'd not done anything with either of them. But then you have that lovely moment when you realize they're actually two halves of one project. And when you put them together, they're yes. really interesting. So would you like, would you like to introduce um, our viewers to the notion of what the Ludovician was or is? Yeah. So the Ludovician is a conceptual shark, which means it's the idea of a shark. It's a living idea. And it's a non-physical creature which swims in flows of conversation, streams of interaction, and it eats memory and identity. And so if a Ludovician has your scent, you have to do everything you can to mask your identity, to mask your sense of self, pretend to be someone else, don't contact anyone because it loves uh, degrees of separation. It can find you through degrees of separation very, very quickly. And it consumes more and more of your mind and your memory until eventually you're a complete blank and you're gone. So it's a, it's a scary thought creature. And this was something that was kind of 
this was something that you conceived in a book before we had, you know, we had our homes full of artificial intelligence and things like Alexa and Siri and and Google that was kind of imagining what we might want because the internet wants to please you, doesn't it? It wants mm -hmm. you to like the internet. So in a way, you were kind of prefiguring a lot of the evolution of the internet through what you invented with Ludovician, weren't you? I guess so. I guess it was kind of a, a lucky accident in one way, but also I think... Terrifying as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, this kind of interconnectedness, I think when I was writing the book was already a big deal. I mean, we kind mm. of say now looking back, you know, we didn't even have, or we just barely got Facebook when yeah. Chart came out. So we sort of think of it as pre-internet, but actually it wasn't. We were, we were still very much coming to terms with email and what yeah. we thought at the time was interconnectedness. I mean, it was nothing compared to how we are now, but no. it was, it was kind of dealing with those ideas. And then I think around the time the book came out that, that, that internet space became massive for everyone. So, I mean, we, we've done, you know, 25, 26 interviews now, and we're always very interested in how one develops a character. And some some people we've spoken to, uh, they almost go through a formal interviewing process and they know every aspect of their character's um, personality. And then they follow them through a plot. Other people, Sophie Hanna being one of them, comes up with the plot. The first thing she writes, the first thing she writes is the blurb on the back of the book. And the characters bloody well do what she tells them to do. <laughs> so I just sort of wondered, how do you um, how do you build a character? Where do you, where do you start? I love the idea of starting with the blurb on the back of the book. That's yeah, it's great, isn't it? Yeah, um, I guess there are two different things. There's um, it can be what sort of story I want to tell. And yeah. The lead character. What is this story? What sort of ideas and themes do we want to get at what and then the question is what's the most interesting sort of person to have this experience it's like that old dramatic thing is like you know what is the person who this experience would affect the most yeah what's happened to that person in their past that would make this experience especially hard you know and so it's almost like creating a character to have that adventure or that experience because that experience that you want to explore as a writer will be especially hard and interesting for them to go through right okay so that that is one thing the other thing is just letting them talk i find mm. sometimes characters who i didn't expect to be big characters become big characters because they open their mouths and are just interesting right I, i'm working on a script right now where um there are two teenage girls who were meant to only be in the pre-credit sequence and they're having a conversation and they're sisters and the older sister said something and the younger sister turned around and just, I mean, I was really surprised when the dialogue came out, just absolutely destroyed her, this brutal, horrible over the top takedown of her sister. And I immediately thought, you guys are leads. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is so cool. You're so interesting. You're just gonna go at each other in the most entertaining way. So I need to make space for you in the story. So there's, there's, there's that, there's the mechanical approach where, you know, it's, what do I need? What yep. does the story need? Who's the most interesting person to, who will really go through the ringer with these things? And then there are people that just earn their spots because they're so much fun and so interesting. So is, is there a kind of visceral moment where a character takes over from you and you become a, you become a way of channeling what they're, what they're trying to say onto the page? Yeah, I mean, it's not so much that I become them, but they do things I don't expect sometimes. I mean, I think it it happens more in my script writing than in my novel writing because I think, I guess though in the earlier parts of my novel writing, it does happen, but they tend to, characters do sometimes just tend to do their own thing, which I kind of let them do because it's not really them doing their own thing. It's some part of my subconscious realizing there's a more interesting thing for them to do. And so when that happens, you know, you, you let it happen. There's a, in my, my TV show, uh, there's a a young boy who has this interesting first couple of episodes and then his parents ground him. And for the first few drafts, he just kind of sits there feeling awful and yeah. just don't really understand him and you feel bad for him, but he kind of just sits there and takes it. And then I was doing a draft and I got to his part in episode two and, and I had some dialogue for him and he just said, screw this, got up, packed a bag and walked out of the house. And I was like, oh, oh, he's on the move. 
This is interesting. We need to follow him. Yeah, and I just let him go, see where he went, and and followed the logical things about what he would do. And it was it wasn't like I say it wasn't really the character taking over and doing its own thing. What it was was the some part of me realizing that the story needed to go in that direction. That kid shouldn't have sat in his room for three episodes. But also, it was a complete surprise for me when he just, you know, packed his rucksack and, and exited stage left. So when you're when you're writing for TV, which I will talk about in depth, mm. but you know, you're writing an hour, an hour's worth of television, and an hour of television has its own particular kind of beats, doesn't it? You you kind of know where the now when you're when you're setting off to write um, different fish, the novel that became Raw Shark Text. You were starting as an artist, and I love the notion that by the time you'd swum out of the book at the end, you, you kind of emerged wet on the side of the pool as a writer and an artist. Did you? You didn't know where you were going. So how how did you manage structure, or did you not worry about structure? I, I knew where I wanted to end up. Yeah, I think if I have a, a solid idea of where I want to end up, and I think the place where this is going to end up is interesting. If I understand 60% of where I'm going to end up, not line by line, but the feel of it and where the character is going to end up, then I think that's okay. It's all right to have an unknown middle. Hmm. Um, that's the most important part. I think the worst thing is getting to the end and actually realizing you've gone down a blind alley and there's no satisfying way to wrap up. So what I find is I do think ahead to make sure I know where we're going to come out of this thing. And actually, I do I do the same with scripts too, um, because I don't know I don't I don't I don't like structure. Or I do, but I don't like. Um, I think we're all so story savvy now in this day and age that I think your brain does a funny thing when you're reading or watching. It skips ahead and it can spot the shapes of things. Yeah. And actually, without realizing why, you get quite bored because you realize you know the shape of what you're seeing. And so I try and put things deliberately in the wrong place because it's interesting and your brain doesn't expect them. And I think, um, yeah, I think especially at the moment where all we can really do is read and watch TV and spend a lot of time in front of screens. I think everyone's brains are so story savvy that I think uh, traditional structure is a bit of a trap because, yeah, your, your viewers are always ahead of you or your readers are always ahead of you. Yeah, and I think there is that thing when you sit there and you think, "Oh, I know, oh, he did it," or "I know where this is going to go." But we we were talking in a, in another conversation about the fact that we are all now we're, we're more sophisticated, aren't we? Because we're used now instead of watching a two hour film, we kind of want an eight hour story arc on a box set. And does that? Um, do you think the work you're doing as a TV writer is going to affect how you write as a novelist in the future? I think it's interesting. I think it, if film had still been the thing, then it, it would have been two very different processes. But I think an eight hour story across eight scripts isn't hugely different to the shape of a novel. Yeah. And I think maybe TV is becoming more like novels. But I think there's a sort of there's a sort of immediacy to writing scripts because you know you have to be brief. Yeah. And so I think it kind of it kind of frees me from the really careful detailed minutiae that I, I put in my novels that I put there that like we we're saying because you can read at any speed and you can dig and you can go back which is really cool and I enjoy it but also I think the difference is with scripts you just you can just tear through drama and a story and dialogue at, at almost at actual speed and so I think um yeah, I think it will change. I think my next novel might be more filmic and yeah. that it might be more drama-based and less page-based, if that makes any sense, less less, um, less about the act of reading and more about just just straight story, I think. I mean, I said that last time, I'm sure. I'm not sure it'll come off. <laughs> so in, in, in Raw Shark, as well as the, the 36 core chapters, there's also the lost sections or the the negatives or the unchapters, mm. as I think you, you've coined the phrase. So what it, is that about, um, 
is that about you kind of showing your workings to use the kind of school way or is it is it a way of is it you going around the back of the screen and looking at the story from another angle it's about blurring the edges of the book really i mean the yeah. book is a, a lot about um trying to hold on to things and the ultimate truth being that you can't really hold on to everything you know time passes things fall apart memories fade you know you've got to treasure what you have when you have it and the the thing but talking about the mechanics of but the, the the mechanics of the kind of worked against the sort of story i wanted to tell was that books you know preserve they last forever and they have yeah. very neat solid cut off edges and i wanted to create a device that actually creates some blur around the edge of the story so that there were extra bits extra chapters extra things that you could find but they were intentionally designed so that no one could or would find them all i mean there were a couple that were written like whole chapters that were written and they were put in a bottle there was one that was put in a bottle and thrown in the sea and there was one that was fastened to the underneath of a bench that you could find if you could work out in the book exactly where it was and the story the chapter from under the bench did disappear somebody had it but i mean those things i mean unless anyone randomly decides to share them years from now are gone so the story stays the edges of the story stay blurred and incomplete so the the story in the bottle has never turned up no it might wash up one day so that's fascinating to me because a lot of writers see that their their role is to take this story that is burning a hole inside them, putting it on paper and, and giving it to a grateful world. You see your role as sometimes it's about writing the story is enough and it doesn't necessarily have to be read. I think um I think it's about degrees. I mean Rorschach had a core yeah story that i was very keen for people to see but also i like the diffuse elements of it i like burying things i like making sure that you know i think there's something so satisfying about being the only person to have spotted something there's stuff in russia that people still haven't spotted you know there's a whole like without giving too much away there's a whole page that if you can figure out the sequence you can decode extra text from the page that's actually in the book that no one's ever seen and so I just love the idea of being the only person to ever find something in a book that's existed for a long time would be the most satisfying thing ever. It's like buried treasure. And right. so I do like to kind of add layers under. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of Easter egg idea as well, isn't it, that you often yeah. say. But are there, you know, I'm fascinated by your relationship to a narrative and then somebody else's relationship to it. Are there people finding things in the text that you never intentionally put there? Oh yeah, that was a great thing about Rorschach because um, I got to tour with it a lot. So I got a lot of people met, to meet a lot of people that had read the hardback. And Rorschach, I think was written with three readings. The ending, you can read the book three different ways. Yeah. The idea is depending on the kind of reader you are and the sort of personality you have, you will come to believe or your mind will let you believe one reading over the other. And it, it, it works pretty well. And some people don't even realize there are multiple readings and are quite fixed on their version. But in touring around with it, I, I met another 10 or 12 readings that were all valid and all brilliant and all really surprising. So when we did the paperback, I went into the paperback and I just nudged and added things and put in a bit more scaffolding to support these readings that other people had came up, come up with. I mean, the most fun thing was I met this guy and he was absolutely furious. He said, I was loving your book so much till the end. And then what you did at the end absolutely ruined it. And I said, well, what, ha what happened at the end? That, And he came with this massive convoluted thing that I'd never thought of and no one ever said, and he hated it. And so he'd invented this end of the book, which he then hated and spoiled for himself. And Brilliant. I didn't tell him nobody else had ever read it like that, but I just thought that was fascinating. I'm sure that happens with people who watch their Chris Nolan film, which works on, you know, so you have people coming out of the cinema kind of arguing about what film they've seen, even though they've all seen the same thing, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, Sharon Black is asking a question here. She says, um, does it ever go really wrong if you steer clear of structure? Yeah, but um, it goes wrong in an interesting way, at least. Yeah. And I think the secret is you have to build yourself enough time for things to go wrong. But I also think um, 
how badly can things go wrong while you're still writing? Yeah. You know, if if something seems like a strange thing to have happened in the story, then then your your job as a writer is to either cut that out and start again, or even more interesting, say, wow, this story's taken a really weird dog. Like, how do people react to what I found surprising and strange? The reader's definitely going to find surprising and strange. And the character is going to find surprising and strange. So is this actually a really interesting way forward where this kind of wrongness of shape is actually going to send us in a different direction? And I think providing you rolling with the punches and you're having your characters react honestly to whatever happens to them, yes. then you can't really go wrong. So it? you're just turning to another kind of narrative because I think after Raw Shark and before you started writing Maxwell's Demon, which we're going to talk about in detail, you had a kind of, you spent, you had a, quite a long love affair with the video gaming world. Yeah. And their relationship to narrative is, is more immediate and urgent, isn't it, than a book? It's all about where is someone going to go? What are they going to do? How are they going to overcome challenges mm -hmm. and perils? What, what was it like walking into that world? Really interesting, and really cool. Um, you know, there's this amazing thing that you get to invent and then a studio full of a couple of hundred people, artists, programmers, designers, will bring that invention to life. And then you can then pick up a console and walk around physically inside that thing you've just invented and meet the people you've invented. and have wow. them say the lines you've created to you is very cool, very strange. Um, yeah, it's it's very different. It is immediate. And the one thing that's really interesting about it is the strange sense of the first person. It's like mm. super first person in the, it's not the first person of a novel where somebody is, the book is saying I, but you as the reader are not I. You know what I mean? The author is I. But in a video game, you are I in the story. So it's quite strange because you have to consider you're actually putting a player into a role. Yeah. You know, they're not reading about a character. They're, they actually have agency in this role. And so it's about how you create a story around a character that does literally have independent agency from you as a writer. So, and there were situations, I think, when you were writing for video where you you were presented with scenarios which you then had to put characters into. So it worked in two different directions, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think um, what's interesting is you have a lot of different departments who want to do different things. And, you know, there are, we think it would be really cool if we go to the Alps or I think it would be really cool if we have a story with a tank and it's going to go here. And then you do, you kind of do that thing that I was talking about with a plot for story. It becomes like, who are the most interesting people to put in this situation? Where do you get drama from? But it is much more collaborative in that these ideas are coming from all different directions. And so, yeah, it becomes very much like, okay, so this is what the game wants to do. This is what the experience they want to give people it is. And so what's the dramatic experience that enhances that? What makes it exciting or scary or surprising within the actual events of what you're going to be doing? Wow. So, okay, so while you're, while you're writing in the video gaming world, there are, there are other things going on in the Stephen Hall universe, aren't there? There's... Uh, there's an adaptation of raw shark text into another medium. But at that point, you were already thinking about the book that became the book that was published yesterday. Uh, yeah. Maxwell's yesterday. Indeed. And, um, you know, I think, I think what's wonderful already is that a uh, great review by Chris Brookmeyer calling it deliciously diabolical, which I think is, <laughs> a, is a, you know, really. that'd be a nice thing to have on a tombstone, actually, wouldn't it? Delicious. <laughs> wickedly playful and it's already had some amazing critical acclaim which is fantastic um so while while you're spending kind of maybe 10 years writing the second book even when you're not writing it i guess your mind is still figuring out 
it's more world building, isn't it? I think where I'm trying to get to. You're building worlds in the video gaming world, and Maxwell's demon is becoming what it becomes. Mm. Any anyone who spent ten years writing a book, <clears throat> the outside world would look in and say, "Oh my God, you had the most terrible writer's block." I'm guessing that that phrase is an anathema to you, though, isn't it? Because of the way you think about writing. So I'm just interested in why does it take so long to get where you need to go, and is that necessarily a negative thing? Um, I think it's only a negative thing because. It wouldn't be a negative thing if you could go into a time machine, <laughs> spend 10 years without aging, and then come back. I don't resent yeah. the time I spent on it at all. I think the fact that the world turns and life moves on is, mm. is a little difficult. And the fact that I was kind of aware also that, that readers who love the Rush Art text kind of wanted to read the next one. So yeah. I, it's bad in that sense, but I don't, I don't, I think it was the right amount of time to spend on it. And I was jumping in and out to do other things. But also that's because I think there are a lot of things that I didn't understand and that I hadn't figured out. And there's a subconscious element to letting your brain solve a problem or letting your brain understand where it needs to go. And sometimes, um, yeah, sometimes going in the wrong direction, allowing mm. for that and coming back or going in the wrong direction, coming back, then realizing the wrong direction wasn't the wrong direction at all. It was the interesting direction. And I think um, Rorschach did all of the things I'm interested in at the same time and did all of them, I think, pretty well. And yeah. so I kind of made a rod for my own back really and that i didn't feel that i wanted or could write a book that only did some of those things having kind of done all of them the first time around i wanted to do them all again but do them all better yeah and so that's a big challenge and um i think the book was probably written you know uh, in different ways the book's been probably 10 different books it's been taken apart but put back together and I think certain sections of it I mean I don't think it's an exaggeration to say there might be bits in that book that have been rewritten a thousand times which sounds insane to say but I would say that there are there are definitely paragraphs in that book that have been written in the rewritten in the high hundred times yeah I mean, it doesn't become, insane, but it's the right but it was the right thing for the book wasn't it yeah and it, it's what it needed and it needed that level of slightly deranged obsession because it's a book about slightly deranged obsession and um it's what it wanted and it was a case of just sort of keeping pushing and keeping pushing and, and the, that really weird feeling that when you have an idea for something and a sense of what something could be and it's just so big and crazy and, yeah. and nuts and but then you have to make that awful choice. It's like, do I climb this mountain that I know is going to take me forever and is going to be exhausting yeah. and I'm going to keep falling off, but I've kind of, I can, I can see it. Or do I climb this slightly smaller, easier mountain and just pretend I never saw that one. And it's like, I just couldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so but you're always going to be tempted by the mountain, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Sadly, just who I am. So at the, at the center of, uh, at the center, if you like, of Maxwell's Demon, we have um, Thomas Quinn, but we also have um, this character, Andrew Black, who wrote a million copy selling mystery novel and then disappeared mm -hmm. nine years ago. Interesting. You know, Stephen Hall. Yeah, interesting indeed. Um, so with with the narrative of that book which works on i'm looking forward to rereading it because i suspect it works on even more levels than i think it works on um just going back to structure again in the meantime like you've written raw shark text you've learned a huge enough about a lot about yourself as a writer but you've been writing video games you've written tv film scripts and you're writing maxwell are you getting more and more things in your in your kind of toolkit about yourself as a writer and you're kind of are you are you able to do stuff now that you couldn't have done in 2007 yeah yeah i think 
the thing I wasn't prepared for, because I wrote Rorschach texts and I got to the end of that and I thought this is a good book. It's a really solid book and I would, you know, stand by it till my dying day as being a good book. That means great. That means I can write books now. No, it doesn't. It just means I could write that one book, <laughs> <laughs> which is really surprising. It's like, I, oh, now I need to learn to write a different book, which is a whole different process. And I'd heard people say that in the past and I thought, now you're crazy. If you can write a story, you can write a story. But no, it was, it was not quite starting from the beginning, but it was so different. It, it it was it was almost from first principles. It's like oh, I don't, I didn't know anywhere near as much as I thought I knew. I taught myself how to do the things I was doing in that book well while I was doing them, but here are all these new things I'm trying to do now. And guess what? I've not tried to do those things before. So yeah, it was kind of humbling, but also going along, learning more things, digging into things with research and and learning stuff. Yeah, from different disciplines. I thought this is interesting. This is a new way of looking at it and doing things and. So stopping and putting those things in or seeing if those things needed to go in. So say, I know you're writing like an eight hour TV project at the moment. Are, are you gonna, are you kind of given the same license that you're given by your publishers? To just go off and just work your evil magic and come back. Or are you, are you being more kind of straight jacket into what you need to do for the format? No, I'm, I'm, I'm being given a lot of license. I mean, I was lucky in that I wrote a TV series, an interactive TV show called Phone Book a few years ago. And um, what happened was the British Film Institute gave me a chunk of money to write all of the scripts, which is kind of unheard of, you yeah. know, because it seems it's insane to me, but the scripts seem to be the last thing that generally gets done. You know, they come up with the idea, then the outline, then a treatment, then a Bible. And then when every tiny little idea has been nailed down, then somebody starts yeah. writing the script, which seems just utterly backwards because, you know, nothing exists until it's on the page. You know, tone isn't there, dialogue isn't there, the feel of the thing isn't there. Everyone mm -hmm. can be sitting around a table talking about three completely different things and all think they're talking about the same thing. But anyway, I got this money that allowed me to write some scripts and that meant that we had you know seven or eight hours of tv that i'd written that i could show people and that we could say look this is what happens if you can just let me work and I've been really really lucky in the um element pictures who i'm doing rush art text with yeah basically just let me work on a new series and said here's some money go away and write us eight episodes of a tv show you know, I did the pilot, we talked about it. They liked the ideas and where it was gonna, well, what I thought it might go. They said, I don't really know yet, but I think it might go over here. And they said, great, just go for it, which is wonderful. And it is pretty much unheard of, but I think the fact that it, the process works for me and that it produces good results and it produces them startlingly quickly as well. For someone who spent 10 years on a novel, my scripts come out really quickly, which is, never ceases to make Mel and my wife laugh. <laughs> but, um, so I think the more I work and hopefully when one or other shows go into production, the more I'll have that leeway to do that with other people that I'll just be able to write like I would a novel, just with that freedom. But I think it's interesting. I think if I'd have been doing scripts 10 years ago when Rorschach came out, I think it would be a lot more rigid, but I think there's so much TV now that I think people have come around to understanding what we were just talking about, that actually structure is your enemy. If there are 10,000 TV shows to pick from, you want to be the one that doesn't feel like all the others. Yeah. So phone book started life as a, two-page short story didn't it which appeared in picador anthology of new writing in I, I, 2005 i think and at first sight it is two pages from a phone book it's yeah got name address exactly. numbers and occupation does it also say the occupation i can't remember yeah it has it has a name and then there's a, a line of text then dot 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 and then a number but you it, where it would normally be the address it just has a one sentence description about the character, which could be anything, just uh, a, a dark secret or a boring fact yeah. or 
you know, but lots and lots of different ones. So was that something that you, you sat, you, you know, you wrapped your head in a wet towel, went into a room and wrote really fast. Or was it something that you spent a year laboring over? Oh, phone book. I think it was about two hours. Yeah, it was, it was, wow. um, the story, the short story was, yeah. was a couple of hours. It was one of those things that once you have an idea for the structure, it just came out all at once. Um, which was awesome. And I think the biggest idea in phone book is playing with that structure. It's like that what we're talking about, invading another form and seeing what the, the fun things are with that form, what you can do, you know, okay, we only get one line for every character. So what can we do? We have a couple of characters whose description is both an identical twin who have the same surname. Yeah. And so there's little games that go on across the page like that. But yeah, that came really, really fast. There was, I think there was a week where I wrote um, three things that have all gone to grow into bigger things. And sometimes you just have those crazy hyperproductive weeks where things just come out and then you're playing with those things for years afterwards. So um, Ita is asking a question here saying, do you, do you sleep at night with all of that going on in your head? Which I, I love that as a question because... Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, brain, the brain never sleeps does it so you know is your body asleep at night or are you just lying there filing away the day it can be hard actually um i have a lot of note cards and a lot of notebooks and sometimes i've learned that if something comes and it's good i just get up and write it down not right. not write it in finished form but write it in you know bullet form or whatever make sure it's out of my head because if it comes, it will keep coming and then the whole thing will keep unraveling. And it's best to get the idea down and pin it than to lie there and let it evolve to the point where you realize, oh no, I've got 15, 20 pages I've got to write before I'm gonna get to sleep now. So yeah, I do try and make sure if I have a really good idea, I've got quite good at jumping up, writing the parameters of it down, telling myself, look, there it is, it's safe. Don't think about it anymore, go to sleep. But yeah, it is difficult. And it's not just sleeping, actually. I mean, my wife is, it's like, we've, she stops inviting me on shopping trips. She says, you just sort of stand there and look into space. <laughs> so, you brought um, that in well, I think, yeah. Yeah, but I think um, it's, it's one of those things that I have to try and consciously be mindful to be present, to be in the moment because my brain is always skipping out, working on something, building something, playing with something, changing something, and it just, and I think because it's sort of been trained to do that, it tries to do it all the time. So yeah, the hardest thing for me, and I'm definitely working on it, is just not, just being present. So interesting that most books are, you know, they are locked off, there's a printed copy. And that that is it go, goes out into the world has its own life clearly you can't leave raw shark alone because you have written these unchapters these negative chapters and who knows there may be more of those coming i don't know so you are you are kicking against the form constantly aren't you yeah i mean with yeah. something like phone book which you adapted for tv i mean that was the most ambitious idea. I mean, you, you spend two hours creating a short story and then how many hours of television could that become if somebody watched it all? It's about eight hours. And how many different combinations of watching experience? I think there are more combinations there are than there are um, lottery number combinations. So I think there's 13 billion combinations. That you can okay, go so just just explain how that is possible then because people are not watching it in a linear way yeah so um each chunk of it uh each chapter has a number of films you can watch so you can pick one of three or four characters to watch and you choose what order you watch them in so depending on who you watch in what order you approach each film with knowledge or not having knowledge of what's going to happen and there are also buried things like if you can spot connections with these characters, you can highlight them both and find extra stuff hidden behind them. And so it's like, 
it's exponential. Every time you put a choice in, you double the amount of options. So, and it has, it is crazy. We, we shot a script in hand pilot just to tech, just to test the interactivity. And I think we had 65 actors, 65 characters in the series. So there's a lot, a lot of characters in it and there's a lot of options. Wow. And no, nobody in this incredible journey so far, nobody has taught you. You, you, you haven't been, you haven't been to a creative writing class. You haven't been taught how to write scripts. So you are kind of teaching yourself, but you see that, you see that as a sense of freedom, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's a gift really, because um, depending on who you learn from and where you learn, I think you know, that whole anxiety of influence thing is real. I think there is, you know, they say Melville wrote Moby Dick because he was self-taught and Melville wrote Shakespeare. Melville read Shakespeare. I thought, oh, this is amazing. I'll write one of those. Because nobody had told him, you can't do that, you silly man, he's Shakespeare. You know, nobody had said, you know, that sh that's an achievable, that's a work of genius. And he didn't have that reverence for Shakespeare. He just thought, great, I'll do a, I'll do a, and wrote Moby Dick. And so I think there is an element, it's a, it's a gift not to be daunted. And I think you can't help as you go on to become more daunted. But I think certainly finding your own way and finding your own feet. And, and yeah, I do think of stories like machines. My dad's a mechanic and we always thought we didn't really have a lot in common. But the more I kind of write, the more I think, you know, there's definite tinkering with machines about playing with stories and making them work. So um, Audrey here is imagining what a conversation might be like between you, James Joyce, and uh, Samuel Beckett. <laughs> I, I love that notion. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe, maybe, maybe it's happening somewhere in an unversion of Stephen Hall <laughs> somewhere. Um, do you, because we're, a lot of people watching and will be re-watching this are, are kind of writers at different stages of their career and I think I think a lot of what you said is really really inspirational I that notion of don't be daunted I think is a is a great thing how was there ever a moment in the long journey to publication where you you decided that you might actually just give this book up no no because the book you were giving up then became another book. Is that, did it kind of keep evolving? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it wasn't that I gave it up and wrote a different book. It was the book evolved. And I, I, I was, it became a very fundamental part of who I was that I wasn't going to give it up. And that I, I mean, it, it was, it was real white whale stuff. You know, <laughs> I could very easily have gone down fighting on this one, I think, because I had some dark times with it. It's yeah. a hard, hard book. But um, no. And I think maybe I'll be kinder to myself in the future. I think there might be projects that, well, actually, no, I'm lying. No, I don't give up on things. I just keep pushing at them. Only if I lose interest with them. But this book was always fascinating to me. And I think there's a difference between giving up on a project that you're fascinated in, but you don't think you can do versus letting a project go because it's just not, there's not as much there as you thought there was. So no, I mean, no words are wasted. No. Oh God, no words are wasted. No, it's all valuable. And one piece of advice is always keep all of your off cuts. I mean, there are, there are, there are bits in Rorschach texts that are from completely different books altogether. There's a chapter in Rorschach text that is wholesale put in from a different book and you would not know what it was because it was the, it was the one great thing about that thing that I wrote. And it's right. almost like everything else got jettisoned and that one great thing made it into this one. And likewise, there are parts of Maxwell's Demon that I wrote nearly 20 years ago, just little bits of things that didn't have a home and nothing is ever, ever wasted. And even if you never use it again, you know, it's it's all valuable because it's all working out what works and what doesn't and, you know, how the machine works and how you're going to figure out what you're doing. Can you can you very briefly tell us what the, the Maxwell's demon theory is? 
Yeah. So the idea is it's about the second law of thermodynamics, which is about entropy, which basically means everything falls apart, you know, and the mathematical reasons behind the reasons things fall apart are really mundane. And But the act of things falling apart weirdly is what causes time to pass. And it's why people get older. It's why buildings fall down. It's why the sun burns out. The very kind of act, the very thing that we perceive as time is things slowly degrading or changing around you mm -hmm. caused by entropy. And Maxwell's demon is this thought experiment that um, in a very simple way shows that you can set up this very simple experiment and just by knowing certain things, you can do something that you're not supposed to be able to do, which is to reduce entropy without spending energy. And that essentially means reversing time. And so it's this really interesting puzzle that it shouldn't be possible, but for a hundred years, nobody could figure out how this, this setup was actually reversing time, um, undoing the messiness of the world. And uh, it, was, it was kind of a hole in like a core scientific theory for a long time. And yeah. So then you 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 as a you as a novelist decide that I mean did you come it was that a theory that was kind of on your periphery vision and you found that was a kind of wormhole into the novel or was it something that came along later It kind of came along in the early stages but not at the beginning and it does a lot of different jobs in the novel it's it's also about the novel's about a guy whose whose marriage is ending and his life is kind of falling apart and he's very much the embodiment of entropy hmm. and this principle really it's a little bit of magic it's a bit it, it shouldn't work but it does and so it almost becomes kind of a talisman for this idea that you can cheat reality and right. so i think like i was saying with characters everything all the elements of the book really kind of go in there to serve what you're trying to explore. And Maxwell's demon was cool because it has this, this, you know, backbone of scientific theory, which makes it even more fascinating that it's doing something it shouldn't be able to do because this is a scientist telling you that this is a thing. You know, it's like when they talk about quantum physics, you're like, you know, if you put that in a book, nobody would believe it. <laughs> uh, but, I, but I think what's interesting, you know, with with raw shark text, which is obviously a play on the raw shark, the raw shark test, and with Maxwell's demon, you know, you're dealing with really complex uh, ideas here, but, um, which is why everybody watching this should read both books. They're also thumpingly good reads where, you know, real page turning narrative as well. And um, I suppose you do, you do have a responsibility to the reader to get them to be so engrossed they're turning the pages, don't you? Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I, yeah, stories should be exciting and interesting and moving and, and full of cliffhangers. I mean, the engine in Maxwell's Demon, it's a mystery. It's a whodunit, really. Yeah. Um, but it's a whodunit exploring all these big ideas around the nature of reality and how books work. And, but it's also a mystery as to something that's happened. And it's an uncovering of what turns out to be, you know, not spoiling it at all, but more of a family secret than a metaphysical secret. Which and I think that is super, yeah. super important. You know, um, I don't understand why you would ever write a book that isn't gripping. Yeah. Because, I mean, that's that's what we read for. And, you know, I, I and I do actually think that a book that is – intellectually interesting but not emotionally exciting is only half the deal and the same way the other way around i like um, and maybe this is why it takes me so long to write them but i i do believe that it's possible to do both and i like to try and do both wow i mean this is uh i want to rewatch this interview it's been absolutely fascinating and oh, thank um you. And uh, you're back. You've got a few extra questions to throw at Mr. Hall. Oh, we can't hear you actually. There we go. Is that better? Yeah, yeah. we're good. Yeah. 
honestly one technical hitch after another um <laughs> i think this is just mind-blowing Stephen. it really is what the word that come it came to me as you were speaking was disruptive because i mean that's the the, the thing we apply to business and to internet companies and all the rest of it but you really are you don't have any barriers do you to your imagination and your creativity it's just it's like drawing in all these things and it all sort of churning up and it comes out in whichever way or form suits i think that's just it's it's mind-blowing the i mean how you've created the broad i can see i can absolutely see why it's 10 years between books now <laughs> and that makes and that makes perfect sense like you wouldn't this is not something you'd want to rush it's not somebody was asking a question there about um how would you put writing a series but but that's not what you're about this is about it's literally like creating art is it for you putting everything together yeah and i think there's something about putting something between two covers that you know is gonna last well potentially forever i mean i i really want to consider every element of it I mean, that's not to say that I don't want to write something faster and quicker and more series based at some time. I just, this book had to be what this book had to be. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. Well, you have the series option when you're writing TV. That's where your series, I suppose, ideas develop and, and yeah. along a different, a different, in a different media. I love the drawing it together of all these different things and the artistic, I can see where your artistic background's coming in there um, at every point. But you play with words, I'd say, in the same way that you play with image. And that's the, it's like there's no barriers it's everything is elastic and it can be moved around and it's fascinating absolutely fascinating. Lo loads of comments there i'm dying to read the book i mean i really just the whole concept of moving time around and just yeah no definitely dying to read it um yeah. and the link guys in the comments to maxwell's demon which is a beautiful beautiful hardback so um i would urge it's you already I see people have already ordered Raw Shark Text and Maxwell during the conversation, which is what I love about the connectivity. Oh, amazing. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I know yeah. you've got to run, haven't you, Stephen? Because you've got, you other... got to go at one o'clock because you have a very important, uh, your daughter has a very important date. Yeah. She does. I'll hand back to you, Sam. I just wanted to say, Stephen, it is always amazing to be inside your head for an hour. Thank <laughs> you for your generosity. This has been amazing. And I know everybody needs to go and buy the book and we should have another session in a few months time when people tell us what they think it's about yeah <laughs> that would be, that would be great thank you so yeah so, thanks so much for having me it's been a pleasure thank you so much for joining us now it's fantastic lovely listen i'm going to stop recording so we'll say goodbye to everybody make sure you buy the book um and have a lovely day thank you very much